This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gito Yowat. It's Wednesday, October 7th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Ahead of World Mental Health Day on October 10th, Human Rights Watch is detailing how people across dozens of countries are being shackled because of their mental health conditions. We warn you that some of the images are disturbing. Angela Okumadu reports. In a traditional healing home in Nigeria's Ibadan, Olushegun is in shackles, one of hundreds of thousands of men women and children with mental health conditions that Human Rights Watch said on Tuesday are living in chains. It's been five months since the chain was put on my legs. It hurts when I walk. Through nearly 800 interviews, a Human Rights Watch report has described how people in roughly 60 countries can live shackled for years, chained to trees, locked in cages or imprisoned in animal sheds. Around a third of those countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. Kriti Sharma is a senior disability rights researcher for the NGO. We have documented shackling across countries, cultures, socioeconomic strata, um, ethnicities. It's a practice that is occurring around the world and that is why governments need to take action now and stop brushing this issue under the carpet yes sir last year nigerian raids on islamic rehabilitation centers made global headlines after boys and men told of being shackled beaten and sexually abused but the ngo said that such abuse extends around the world in state-run and private centers and in traditional and religious healing institutions where handlers deny people food, force medications and herbal remedies on them and met out physical and sexual punishment. Sharma added that in many countries, such services are very profitable businesses. Angela Okumadu of Reuters with that report. Citizens of Mali are jubilant Wednesday over the decision by ECOWAS to lift sanctions on the country. In a communique, ECOWAS says the military junta has met all the requirements stipulated, including appointing a civilian transitional leader and prime minister, and the promise that the transition will last 18 months, starting from September 15th. Importantly, the vice president will not replace the transition president. Musa Kondo, country director of the Accountability Lab Mali, says, however, the new transitional government does not include technocrats who would be able to solve Mali's many security and economic problems. Kondo also says the government lacks enough female and youth representation. He says Malians also welcome the release of opposition leader Sumaila Sisse and a French aid worker by suspected Islamists, but said some are concerned about rewarding the kidnappers with ransom money that they could use again to abduct more people. Let's go now to the Congo, where an Ebola survivor says that the disease outbreak has given her an enduring sense of purpose. Edward Barron explains. Esperance Nayabintu says catching Ebola was both a curse and a gift from God. A year ago, the virus killed her husband. Most of her neighbors, friends and family abandoned her such as the social stigma of surviving the disease. But undaunted by the challenge of bringing up 10 children alone, she's become a social worker, supporting other ostracized survivors like herself in the east of Democratic Republic of Congo. When I was told that I was positive with Ebola, 
I was so frustrated. I later understood that it was a disease like any other and can be cured. In June, the government announced the end of the two-year outbreak that killed more than 2,200 people, just as a genetically distinct flare-up of the virus emerged on the other side of the country. Despite effective vaccines and treatments that dramatically boosted survival rates, the social and emotional impact of survival has received less recognition. For 13-year-old Adafine Mauer, the trauma of losing her entire family to the disease recently caused her to stop eating and talking. Her uncle arranged for Nayabintu to visit and support her emotionally. I feel really good when I meet an Ebola survivor and give them moral support. It makes me feel useful because it's God who chose me. I'm not special. There are lots of people who haven't become sick. I got sick and now I am an ambassador of healing. For those living in the eastern Congo, the highly contagious novel coronavirus has complicated an already dire situation as the region struggles from armed conflict and the recent fight against Ebola. <laughs> but for Esperance, the Ebola outbreak has given her an enduring sense of purpose in supporting those around her. Edward Barron of Reuters with that report. Resiliency funds are helping black-owned businesses stay afloat during the coronavirus pandemic. The Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce says it has raised $1 million and expects to award grants to some 150 recipients ranging from $2,500 to $10,000. VOA's Maria Madiello reports on some of the businesses benefiting from the funds. Mannequin Madness is a black-owned business that received so-called resilience funds from the Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce to help make it through the coronavirus pandemic. Judy Henderson is the owner. I'm standing here right now because we did get the resiliency fund. I only had enough to kind of just pay payroll for a couple of more months. The $10,000 grant helped the company offer new services like a photography studio for dogs. Now that we have some new initiatives, we have other revenue streams coming in, and that's what's helping to keep things up. Gwehi James, fashion designer and entrepreneur, received a $5,000 grant. She used to sell her colorful dresses and headwear at festivals and conferences until most were canceled because of the pandemic. The funds helped add a new line to her business, face masks. I think just the African-American community in general um, we have a history of having to support each other, right? And so there are opportunities that are presented that we don't often qualify for. So oftentimes we have to turn to our neighbor and turn to people within our community to assist us, to help us. And so in a sense, that's what this resiliency fund has been for a lot of us business owners. Something echoed by Kathy Adams, who heads the Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce. Our Black-owned businesses have been marginalized for so long, and we figured we had a call to action to do something. The Resiliency Fund is one of several such programs created in the U.S. since the pandemic closed businesses earlier this year. The Oakland Group says the funds help offset not only the disproportionate impact the virus has had on African-American families, but also the difficulty black businesses have in lending bank loans. Maria Madialou, VOA News. South African Andrew King's tattoo parlor was suffering from the pandemic lockdown and social distancing. So he gathered a team and put their creativity into other fashionable designs to fit the market. King created a shirt with a built-in mask for COVID-19, which would prove a hit in South Africa, the country worst hit by the virus on the continent. Franco Puglisi reports from Johannesburg. South African tattoo parlor owner Andrew King's business was hit hard by the pandemic. It was devastating and because uh, the tattoo industry uh, was regarded in the same as uh, the beauty industry, like the hairdressers and such as. But instead of rolling over in defeat, he put his creative skills to work with clothing designers to fight COVID-19. So the concept, the idea of having a fixed uh, mask um, really appealed to me. Then of course, 
we came, went back to the drawing board with Andrew and um, the thing was to have a product that was actually medically certified. The result, King's Pure Hair brand shirt has a filter inserted into the neck that has been independently tested. And we recently tested the D15 mask and the results we got was very good. But especially on the bigger particles, uh, we had great results, making it very effective against the spread of um, COVID-19. The neck of the garment is pulled up over the mouth and face when needed to prevent droplets from spreading the virus. But the mask can also be tucked away when not required. So practicalities is when the mask is up, people can turn their heads up and down side to side. And the convenient side of it is that you can put it down and it's always on you. The shirt could prove a hit in South Africa, the country worst hit by the virus on the continent. It's good to wear them when you have forgotten your mask and it's easy to pull up and especially because I work with clients, it's nice and easy to put on, tie it back, make it comfortable and it's easy breathable and easy to talk through as well. Okay, it comes with a certificate and a filter in there. Okay. Just one of the latest creation as the world adjusts to the reality of COVID-19. Franco Buglisi for VON News, Johannesburg. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a Kenyan startup develops an app that helps keep people safe by taking health care to their homes. Stay with us. Welcome back to Africa 54. U.S. President Donald Trump is back at the White House after being released from the hospital where he was treated for COVID-19 and he is tweeting, urging Americans not to be afraid of the coronavirus. Many of the Trump's inner circle and those who attended a White House event late last month have since tested positive for the coronavirus. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara reports on how the administration is responding to the outbreak. Upon returning to the White House Monday evening, President Donald Trump took off his mask and urged Americans not to be afraid of the virus. And now I'm better, and maybe I'm immune, I don't know. But don't let it dominate your lives. Get out there, be careful. Trump had no public events scheduled at the White House on Tuesday, but has been tweeting frequently. Some of the tweets downplayed the threat of the coronavirus, the same message that he conveyed in the video of his discharge from hospital. I don't think it's meant to do anything to advance the public health messaging that his own administration is attempting to do. Uh, it is, as it often is with this president, uh, a display of what he thinks strength looks like. Um, but of course, we know that there were some hiccups there as well. Uh, Close-ups of the president, for example, found him to be breathing rather heavily. On Tuesday, the White House released a statement saying the president's vital signs are stable and that he reports no symptoms. Public health experts say that this does not mean he cannot transmit the virus to others. Generally speaking, uh, people with mild illness uh, are no longer contagious by day 10. So first and foremost is if somebody is contagious with 
COVID-19 to stay self-isolated to protect those around you. Meanwhile, the White House has become a virus hotspot, noticeably emptier than normal as some staff work remotely. Other than the President and the First Lady, there are at least 11 White House and Trump campaign staffers who have tested positive, including Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany. That number does not include undisclosed infected lower-level staff and Secret Service agents. At least 11 people who helped with the presidential debate last week have tested positive, as well as three Republican senators, two religious leaders, and three journalists who may have been infected during a White House ceremony on September 26 that has become a potential coronavirus superspreader event. The White House says contract tracing is underway. The administration faces criticism for involving neither the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention nor the municipal government of Washington, D.C., where many staffers reside. Looking backward is important, particularly for super spreader events, because knowing who the source was for an infection can help identify where other transmission patterns could have happened. In other words, uh, knowing where President Trump um, was exposed may be important to identify other people who may have been exposed at the same time. The First Lady's office released a memo on Tuesday outlining precautionary measures including full personal protective equipment and daily testing for staff working in the residential part of the White House where the first couple is recovering. Trump has just over a week to get well before he is scheduled for a second debate with Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden on October 15th. Trump tweeted he is looking forward to it. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. With the U.S. election day less than a month away, many Americans have voted early or voted by mail, and many more are expected to do so between now and November 3rd. Former Vice President and Democratic candidate Joe Biden has been campaigning in the swing state of Florida, while President Donald Trump, who is recovering from COVID-19, has vowed to be back on the campaign trail soon. VOA's Elizabeth Lee has more. President Donald Trump is back in the White House recovering from COVID-19, saying on social media he is looking forward to a scheduled October 15th debate with Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden in Miami. In a separate recorded video posted on Twitter, Trump had the following message about the illness that put him in the hospital. Don't let it dominate. Don't let it take over your lives. Don't let that happen. We're the greatest country in the world. We're going back, we're going back to work, we're going to be out front. As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. I stood out front, I led. But Trump's handling of his illness and approach to the pandemic is being criticized by Joe Biden, who spoke during an NBC News town hall Monday night. These masks, they matter. It matters, it saves lives, it prevents the spread of the disease, social distancing. Instead of talking about what the only thing I heard was one of the tweets saying that, you know, don't be so concerned about all this, essentially. There's a lot to be concerned about. 210, million, 210,000 people have died. Biden has been campaigning in the battleground state of Florida, a critical state in the presidential contest. As you all know, and quite frankly, if we win Florida, you've won. While Biden has been leading Trump in national polls, a new poll this week shows Trump is tied with Biden in Florida, a state Trump won in 2016. Voters 65 years and older are a key demographic in the U.S. because they are the most committed, says political analyst Rayfield Sunnenshine. Look, what seems to be happening under the surface is that Biden's small lead among older voters, an absolute bedrock for Republicans, is increasing. Wednesday's vice presidential debate in Salt Lake City is the next major event on the campaign agenda. It is now even more relevant following Trump's illness. It reminds everybody that there's a 74-year-old running against a 77-year-old for president, and two considerably younger people, one the vice president, the other running for vice president, who could easily be the next candidates on the ticket. The debate styles of Vice President Mike Pence and Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris are likely to be different. Harris is a former prosecutor.
Pence a former governor and radio talk show host. As head of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Pence will likely be defending the administration's response to COVID-19. The outcome of the presidential race, says political analysts, will ultimately be a referendum on President Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. In our tech report, a Kenyan e-health startup has developed a digital platform that takes healthcare directly to Nairobi patients. Tebu Health decentralizes primary outpatient care and is helping people stay safe at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. Africa 54 technology reporter Paul Deho explains. This smartphone application dubbed Tibu is helping patients get the treatment they need while adhering to social distancing guidelines. So at Tibu, what we do is we decentralize primary outpatient care. Uh, said differently, we take uh, the doctor, the clinic, and the lab, and we bring it directly to the patient wherever they are. Kenyans are now beginning to embrace technology more when it comes to their health care. The on-demand platform is particularly relevant when many vulnerable people are choosing to stay home and avoid hospitals. In this time of uh, the COVID pandemic, there's um, 50 to 60 percent decrease uh, in visits to clinics and hospitals. So we're a strategic solution where we are able to deliver the healthcare services to people and keep them out of those locations. And they're worried to go to those locations um, for exposure to COVID, so they prefer to stay home and safe. With this application, our patients can request medical assistance by merely using the mobile application. They connect with the nearest doctor who travels to the patient's home after a triage call. The results are then sent by email to the patient. For a $10 consultation fee, patients can receive a doctor's service within 20 to 30 minutes after the request. Patients say this method is convenient as it saves time and money. It gives me an opportunity to, 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 to avoid the risk of going to the hospital and making long queues, remembering that my age is that uh, risky age where we are not supposed to go where there are so many people and therefore uh, I find it very, very convenient for me and to avoid uh, getting this uh, COVID. In collaboration with Lancet Kenya, Tibu can also conduct an in-home COVID-19 test for 110 US dollars. The application ensures that every patient's data is privacy protected. For us, um, it's extremely relevant that we can bring the healthcare services to the patient, keep them safe, keep them comfy at home. It's very private. Um, all of the data that is collected is encrypted. It's not stored on the patient's phone. Um, it all gets uh, shot up to our servers. So now the patients have access to all of their medical records on demand, um, which is an extremely powerful follow-up tool um, in the healthcare container. Tibu currently has over 2,300 users within Nairobi, and the numbers keep growing. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. The new horror film Antebellum by Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz is the latest of several black horror films addressing race relations in the United States. Filmmakers and critics weigh in on the film and on what defines the black horror genre. VOA's Penelope Pulu has more. There she is. Guess what? Daddy is going to get you dressed for school today. In Antebellum, Veronica Henley, played by Janelle Monet, is a self-assured academic and best-selling author who travels across America speaking about women's rights and racial inequality in the United States. They're stuck in the past. We are the future. A loving mother in an upper-class household, she feels secure in her world until all of a sudden she doesn't. Veronica gets kidnapped and transported to a Louisiana plantation recreated as a replica of one from the 1800s. There, along with a large number of other African Americans who have been abducted, she suffers atrocities. She's given a new name and she is forbidden to speak. Antebellum filmmaker Gerard Bush tells VOA that this horror story came to him in an actual nightmare. And it felt like this woman was screaming across dimensions for help. 
that this needed to be told, that I needed to get the truth out. That is the only way I can describe it. Film critic Tim Gordon acknowledges the power that slavery evokes in antebellum and as a theme in the black horror film genre. I thought 12 Years a Slave, which I think is probably the platinum level of, uh, of, of this genre, which tells this story, kind of did an amazing job. But Gordon says black horror should focus more on the African-American experience in a modern setting. Because I don't really think you got to go far <laughs> to find the horror in, in the culture. You just have to, to be very attentive and be able to articulate it to audiences. Whether it's just the little slights, as there's a scene in Antebellum where they go to a restaurant and it's three of them and they try to seat them by the kitchen next to the dirty dishes. Antebellum filmmaker Christopher Renz tells VOA that while his film focuses on slavery, its modern setting gives it a compelling twist. He says Jordan Peele's 2017 horror blockbuster, Get Out, where black people are held captive for medical experiments by white supremacists in today's America, set the stage for antebellum. I'm not sure if the reception would have been the same if, if Get Out had not happened and was not so successful. Tim Gordon says Hollywood's embrace of black horror has helped it expand into streaming series, such as the Emmy-winning Watchmen, a fictional superhero drama based on a graphic novel where in an alternate universe, a female vigilante cop takes on white supremacists. And Lovecraft Country, a new HBO TV series that blends superhero, sci-fi, and horror genres set in the Jim Crow era. Anything that Jordan Peele is producing and doing in Lovecraft Country, to me, are the epitomes of what this genre can be. And in both cases, they use just simple race in America and look at it and, and find the horrific elements to that. Even so, film critic James Berardinelli says the topic of slavery remains central to the black film genre. One of the most traumatic experiences uh, for uh, people of color in this country in the last 200 years is slavery and its aftermath. Ultimately, says Berardinelli, like the Holocaust, slavery provides an inexhaustible supply of stories to be told on film. Antebellum filmmaker Christopher Rentz agrees. I think that everyone needs to constantly be reminded, and that's the only way that we will never forget and make sure that it never happens again. So I think there's room for a bunch of different stories. We're ready to tell a bunch of different stories. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Washington. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Thank you for watching. <laughs>